Okay, good day, people. So I thought I would follow up a little bit of the dialogue that I recently had with Gary and also some of the video responses and the various personal messages I've received from people. I think, you know, one of the ways for me to contextualize my, I guess, continued interest in some of this is, I mean, I guess I, I want to make clear that I do sympathize with those people who are concerned over the injustices, the hardship, the degree to which life does seem to be a whole lot of suffering, and there are questions about to what extent is this justified or not. And you know, one of the things that I think was interesting as far as the antinatalist debate, when Gary and I were having the discussion, one of the issues that came up was I asked him if he suddenly discovered that there would be life elsewhere. Like if we if we suddenly discovered aliens, right? And I don't think we have any evidence for alien life right now. But if we suddenly discovered alien life, would that change his position? And he basically said no. Um, he said, and you can go check out the video. But he roughly said, you know, it would just be that much more of a problem to deal with. That much more of. Uh, you know, a mess to clean up, right? That's sort of what it would be. And <clears throat> I thought about that, and I, I've thought about it more. And, you know, so I guess part of it is, you know, can we imagine life elsewhere being played by different rules? I mean, perhaps, you know, there could have been a, a longer discussion of, you know, to what extent are pleasure and pain and the kind of suffering that we, I guess align with sentience, to what extent are those inevitable for all forms of sentience, all forms of life, and I mean that could be a question, but I think a different way to come at this would be, this is me, a little shout out video to my friend Brian, who I was in Wisconsin last weekend, and he gave me a three uh, video box set of the Star Wars movies, and I haven't seen these in many, many years, but it was fun, and I, and I watched Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi, and I guess, okay, so this is a fiction, and it's set in a distant galaxy long, long ago, so it's in the, it's in the past, but it is a, a pretty robust imagination pump, and it's kind of a tragic movie. I mean, as much as I, I enjoy it, it's, you know, it's classic, you know, Star Wars sort of stuff, these themes of, of good against evil, and of, of heroic deeds, and of, of self-sacrifice for larger enterprises, all this kind of stuff, and yet... There seems, again, it, it's somewhat tragic that no matter how big the cosmos is imagined and how diverse are the kinds of creatures and no matter how rangy are the, the kinds of weapons and the technologies, you know, we have, we have a Death Star that can take out an entire planet, and yet somehow we're unable to imagine a cosmos that's been... I don't know, spiritually liberated, uh, been liberated into peace, been liberated into, um, I don't know, a kinder, gentler way. And I, when you see a, a video like that, now, again, it, it sort of leads, you know, it leads my sympathies into, yeah, this, this really is just a bloody spectacle and it's, it's war and frenzy and stupidity and brutality and you know if we do say if we sort of agree you know Gary was critical of the Aristotle line which yes it's interesting you know I think part of me does feel like it's overdrawn expectations another part of me again I find it interesting but uh, you know Aristotle says luck is when the arrow hits the guy next to you Gary says no no this is it's not lucky for anyone it's just all around more suffering and if you watch the Star Wars in that light, it is kind of interesting that, you know, the, whether the light side or the dark side of the forest wins, you just get more suffering. And that's really the whole deal. And it is, it's this sort of this tension between order and freedom, you know, sort of this classic, and it could be a limitation. I mean, I guess just as a, as a backdrop, it could be a limitation of intelligibility. I mean, the, the movie was made for, you know, to be intelligible to millions and you're going to have to sell people what they find intelligible and so there could just be constraints in that but it does it does raise for me I guess some some significant questions about what you know what is it about technology and what is it about kinds of progress that we can 
engage in and how none of that can be, I guess, progress made in a spiritual realm for individuals. It seems like individuals are always encumbered with the task of spiritually growing themselves, and none of that can be bestowed either by genes or by technological environment. And <clears throat> I think this is maybe part of the, the larger backdrop, which is, I think sometimes, and I've said this on so many videos, that, I, that these overdrawn expectations or the belief that we need to be doing something really great or life isn't justified. And, you know, some of the examples were the pyramids. You know, people say, well, the pyramids were pretty significant, but the amount of slavery and hardship and cruelty that was involved doesn't justify it. And so even there, it looks like the, the, some of the few things that humanity has really done that looks somewhat significant, uh, all said and done, um, it's it wasn't worth the, the cost. And I think there, you know, again, it, it sort of has that same logic of it has to be outwardly visible, dramatic acts or visible accomplishments that somehow are the register of what what humans are doing or is there something great that has happened. And I guess the more I think about it, that may be, from my perspective, again, I'm, I'm trying to open this dialogue more, but that may be part of where it really goes wrong. That, and there's a, there's, there's a lot of different ways to come at it, but it, it could be that the, and this is a line from the French novelist who wrote The Little Prince, uh, Saint-Exupéry, I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, uh, something like that, but he says that what's in, what is essential is invisible to the eye. And the notion that, again, he says only the heart sees rightly. If, if we start to move toward what are those kinds of feeling, kinds of meaning, kinds of uh, forms of self-awareness, self-understanding that come with a person's spiritual growth. And when I say spiritual growth, I want to be very clear here. Spirit, again, for me, it comes from the word breath, and it has to do with language. It has to do with the degrees to which the human is an animal that cannot live upon bread alone. Yeah, I mean, when people were Again, some of the the video responses to me, people were again calling me a hedonist and or suggesting that I'm advocating animal gratifications. No, no, no. I was trying to point out the irony of someone who's trying to reduce humans to no more than animality to then deny them animal pleasures. I mean, the point was more of an a strategy to bring out a contradiction. It wasn't suggesting that I'm thinking yes, humans are simply animals to be fed. Well, we are, but we do have horizons of meaning, horizons of self-understanding, horizons of love and compassion, and all kinds of other, you know, modes of feeling, which I don't think we're going to align with animal gratifications. We're going to say that in some way, if they are animal gratifications, they're peculiar to this animal that we call the human. Um, again, and it has to do with awareness of death. It has to do with aesthetic creations. Uh, art itself, appreciation of art. I mean, there's a whole whole realm we could give there. But <clears throat> I thought one of the ways that I would try to further this out a little bit, and I, I apologize, I know this video is going quite long, and I still have a lot of things I want to say yet, but uh, this is a line that came from uh, Soren Kierkegaard, and I think Kierkegaard here is really addressing part of the problem that comes when we start to think that we're born just atop previous generations, or as if technological advancement will equal personal betterment or as if the different ways that the genes themselves are expressing through us are the the final or the the end of the story and i think what kierkegaard's going to say is no that's that's really not uh, going to cut the mustard there but what he says here is <clears throat> says when a breed of sheep for example is improved Improved sheep are born because the specimen merely expresses the species. But surely it is different when an individual, who is qualified by spirit, relates himself to the generation. Development of spirit is self-activity. The spiritually developed individual takes his spiritual development along with him in death. If a succeeding individual is to attain it, 
It must occur through his self-activity. That's a really interesting way to come at this, that we have, we've seen so much growth in, in technology, and there is a lot to be said of how much of who we are can be reduced to our genes. And yet, language, speech, that realm that we call the spiritual, right? The realm of the real but invisible. The real but invisible is the spiritual realm. It's the realm of language. But this realm, it opens us up to certain ways of recovering history, certain ideas that you will have to win. You know, if, I, <clears throat> if you take a book, a, a book by Kierkegaard, uh, you're not just going to find the ideas in there, like lying around like rocks in a shoebox. No, you're going to have to win them, earn them. You will scale the mountain that is Kierkegaard's writings, and you will tear your fingers on the crags as you climb it. It will be a great amount of work, and that self-activity, that effort to reclaim the kinds of insights of a person, I think this is part of what, what the meaning horizons that are being are being missed or neglected when we say nothing really significant has happened. When we say, well, wh where, where are the pyramids? Where are the things that make life really great? It could be that there's a kind of invisible radiance, a spiritual potentiality that is grown and cultivated as people struggle to peacefully make meaning in their lives. And so I guess, <clears throat> I'm going to see if I can't further this out, I think one of the things, and I'm going to try to respond to, there was a video uh, by a gentleman here, I'm not sure what the guy's name was, but I think it was called A Pumpkin Full, um, and he posted this response where he's sort of pitting Gary's position against mine, and he, he really, I don't know if he was purposefully trying to misrepresent my view to agitate me or something like this, but I think the thing that I would want to say to him is, look, it's, it's more ambiguous than that. And I don't think it's just about telling people to not have children. If you're going to say what I really want is to tell people to not have children, well, there's a lot of different ways to do that. You can tell people don't have children. You could say become a dink. That means double income, no kid. You could say become a grink, a green um, a green person, no kidder, right? A green oriented, no kidder. Um, there are people who are antinatalist. Now, antinatalist means more than not having children. It means, as much as I understood the video, at least, or the, the videos that have gone on here on YouTube anyway, it means that life is unjustified suffering and one has a moral obligation not to procreate. I thought that was the position. And again, if, it, if it's just saying, look, don't have children, yeah, look, don't have children, adopt, right? I think it would be wonderful if people would say, I'm not going to have children, I'm only going to adopt, and I'm going to adopt because there are going to be pregnancies that happen unexpectedly. I mean, I think part of the irony of the antinatalist position is if there really is life elsewhere, well, then it, it really washes out as an utter impossibility. But if we just pretend for argument's sake that we're sure that we know life is only here on Earth, even there, if you're the last person and you're about to die, um, how do you know someone, I mean, again, we can get at this, how do you know you're the last person? But if you get to this, you know, the, the, a person's dying, how do they know there isn't someone else somewhere hiding who just became pregnant? I mean, there's some sense in which it, it seems infeasible or unfeasible. At any rate, that's, that's not the concern. I think that the way to come at it would be like this, is to try to reveal some of the ambiguity of it, of how it seems odd to want it both ways when we see robust other directions. And let me see if I can illustrate that. Okay. One of the schools that I have tried to advocate on, on multiple occasions here is uh, Nikon. And one of the best translator or the most famous or the person you really want to study there is David K. Reynolds. And uh, Nikon is a Japanese psychotherapy. It's also called reflection therapy or a therapy of uh, indebtedness and uh, gratitude. It's a, called the quiet therapy. And they will do what's called reflection therapy when they sit you down in a room and you begin with your mother and you start with your zero to birth, you know, right at your birth all the way up to six months and then a year and then two years and three years and all the way up until you're a teenager. But you, you answer three questions and the questions are answered between a half hour and two hour periods. The first question is, what has this person given to you? 
How have they provided for you? What have they done to make your life easier and to make sure that you survived? And, you know, how, how, how has this other actually provided for you? And you write all that down and you start again with you from zero to six months to a year to two years, three years, all the way up. List every way that that other has given to you and provided for you. Okay. Second question, how have you given and returned to this person? What have you given back? What exactly have you done uh, to you, for your mother? How have you returned gifts to her? And then the third question is, and again, you do that at length, lots of pages here. Last one is, how have you been an inconvenience or a burden or potentially unwanted? When you add those three together and you, you do this, what you discover is that you have been given much, you have returned little, and you've likely been a pretty significant inconvenience. And I think if people say, oh, that's horrible. No, it has a tendency to snap people into gratitude. They start to say, wow, I've really been pretty selfish. I've been pretty much egoistically just thinking about myself, not realizing the degree to which my life was a serious, serious imposition upon others. Now, we can say that life was an imposition upon a person, but the person, they don't even know they're there for the first couple of months, maybe even for longer than that. Right? I mean, they certainly don't know that they're there in the womb. Now, maybe somebody wants to argue that. I would argue that they don't, uh, that this, this emerges slowly. And so the imposition seems to be much more of an imposition upon the mother who has to go through the pregnancy, a life-risking pregnancy, and all that the person has given to it. And we're, we're so hopelessly, helplessly dependent when we're young. I mean, when you're an infant... You are nothing but a, an ongoing set of impositions and demands and needs. And other people, they come around uh, and, and respond to that. Now, given that, it would seem odd if on Mother's Day, you would want to walk up to your mom and go, Hey, mom, I just want to let you know I can forgive you. I think your, your mother would, be, you can forgive me. Yeah, I can forgive you for having imposed sentience on me. I think we start to laugh and we go, wow, what a juxtaposition of a very, potentially a very narrow view. Now, again, it depends upon the person and their situation. It really depends, right? Most people, though, w most people will find that they have been given much, returned little, and been quite a, uh, quite a pain. Now, let's spin it out a couple of different ways. So let's just say it is Mother's Day. And if it is Mother's Day, you know, it seems like you have one of two options. Now, you have lots of options. You can do whatever you want to do. But if, if one is really serious about antinatalist position and you really want to advocate it, I mean, I understand. I think I, I want to say, look, yeah, life is sorrow and it's hardship and loss. But there are ways of using all of this to cultivate and to grow yourself. And it's an invisible growth. It's a growth of spirit, of compassion, of your humanity, of who you are as a human being. Are you someone who has grown in a gracefulness and been tempered by the horrors of this world? Or are you, have you become a, a grieving bag of of, of ailments who, who wants to just complain. I mean, I think part of it is th what, what will we do about it? So maybe a person says, I, I can't accept this. And what you want to do, and this is, I think, if you go watch the dialogue. This is somewhat, I think, Gary's argument. And this is what I would advocate people who are serious about it. Stop ranting on YouTube and really get serious about it. Form a class action lawsuit. That's right. You form a class action lawsuit against all mothers and you indict them as homicidal criminals that basically every person who is a mother, and this would be the argument, every person who is a mother is a homicidal maniac and they have inflicted suffering and death upon people people who are not asked, not consulted, and the imposition of sentience is capital crime. Now, you're not going to probably seek financial restitution, but you could try to get something like legislation to make it illegal to procreate. Now, that to me would seem like someone who's really taken it seriously. Try to run that up a flagpole. See how many petition signatures you could get for trying to indict all mothers as criminals for 
inflicting the eventual homicide upon their children. I mean, I think if you if you really want to argue that, argue it and pursue it and try to make it a policy. Maybe you think I'm being facetious, and I don't know if I am or if I'm not. Maybe I am. Uh, I think you could, though, instead realize on it's, imagine it's Mother's Day. Realize, depending on your situation, um, but maybe maybe you want to go to your mother. You want to say, you know, Mom, I'm not sure how much I have ever really expressed my thanks and my gratitude and. I know that I was an imposition. I know that my life was lots of need and lots of lots of care was required. And I also want you to know that I never asked to be born. And even if it was an imposition on you, it was also an imposition on me. But I can forgive you. And I forgive you not because it's all rosy in the end and everything is happy ice creams and, and licks from puppies. No, it's because when you step back with maturity and you look at the world as a whole and you say, what is the world as a whole? Well, it seems to be quite a mix. It's a mix of horrors and of of aesthetic treats, it's uh, all of the things that we that make us laugh and cry, those things that make us happy and sad, all those things that, uh, the, you know, the wonderful foods and fruits that we have eaten, all of the, the suffering and the hardships, but it's not that. It's having been invited to be a witness to the fact of this. See, I think Sometimes in the antinatalist debate, I hear a lot of people talk about truth. And in some way, sentience opens us to truth. That is, there is a whole truth about existence that would never have been disclosed had we not been sentient. I am very thankful, despite all of the suffering, all the hardships, and all the injustices, I am very thankful to have witnessed the truth of the fact that this is. Thanks.